Energy use is directly tied to the economic well-being of a country, and our primary source of energy is oil. But oil is a finite resource. What does that mean for our near future? Next up, we'll look at the issue of peak oil and what our municipalities can do about it. Most people seem to feel that we're somewhere in the range of halfway through the oil that's available to us in the planet, and, and that therefore in a fairly near future, uh, we would expect to see a decline in the annual production of oil. It's not going to stop tomorrow, but very soon all aspects of oil production will reach a peak and then we will be in decline, and it will be permanent. Although you can debate whether the world is going to see a peak in oil supply in the near term or longer out into the future, it is very clear that the era of easy oil is over. So now we have a situation where all of a sudden the, the energy prices that we didn't really have to think about before are going to become more dominant in our thinking and in our economic decisions. What's going to be interesting about the decline is we just don't know what it's going to be like. Um, I think it's going to be very bumpy. It's going to have a lot of ups and downs in it. The problem for the decline is we need an increasing amount of oil. The expanding economic system depends absolutely on an expanding money system and an expanding energy system, and they're all interlinked. And if you pull one away, you start contracting one, any one of those things, then the economic system itself will start also to go into contraction. And whether it can contract slowly and carefully, or just simply, or complicatedly, collapse, is a, is a, a very um, difficult question. Our refinery uh, brings in crude oil, primarily from British Columbia in Alberta, by pipeline, and then processes that crude oil into a variety of products that are used here in the lower mainland. Virtually everything refined here at this location is consumed in the lower mainland. There are about 500 trucks a day delivering uh, fuel into the lower mainland of British Columbia. Our refinery produces roughly 150 of those trucks on a daily basis. We've built our society on the foundation that oil is cheap and is readily available. And so without much thought, we've incorporated it into our lives in, in thousands of ways. People tend to think of oil in terms of the price at the gasoline pump, but there's way more to oil than that. In fact, if you look around and try to find anything that isn't touched by oil and oil and gas, you'll have a very hard job. Obviously, the, the, the top, the leading contender would be transportation, uh, where we use an enormous amount of our oil, but it also comes into uh, the products that we consume, the plastics and, and so on, uh, of thousands of products that we use every day. Um, and to a lesser extent in North America in, in the heating of, of homes and spaces and things like that. And so when you've built your entire system, your transport, your food, your, ke your, your chemical industries and just about everything else you can name on um, oil and in ever increasing quantities and then you suddenly find that you've got ever decreasing quantities and your entire industrial civilization rests on this, you've got big trouble. It's all been based on this idea that, that we can pretty much have as much as we want almost on a whim. And, and it's been priced accordingly and it's been used accordingly. And so there's a huge shift, not just in the infrastructure, but in the mindset um, that we are going to be forced to go through. And, and if we do so willingly, it'll be easier for us. But one way or another, we're going to go through that transition. We need to find a broad solution and engage a lot of different parties in helping to find what the various solutions are to meet our future energy needs. We're looking at virtually all of the alternative energy sources that are being developed. We're participating in some way, shape or form as are many of our competitors. This is a systemic problem and it needs to be addressed at a system level. This is an, largely an infrastructural kind of a problem. 
You get the city you build for. We're standing here beside a rapid transit station that was built about three years ago, and now we're starting to see higher density development coming along at the stations. And so you've got more people close to higher quality transit. Obviously, a lot of those people are going to take that choice for a lot of their trips. To pick a very important example, something that we can do now is join the existing Vancouver Car Co-op and see it extend. That has a dramatic effect on reducing the amount of oil used per capita. Well, right, right behind us here, we have an example of a high occupancy vehicle lane where you have to have two people in the vehicle in order to use the lane. And traditionally, those have been thought of in terms of congestion management tools. But now we're going to be thinking more and more of it also in terms of the energy considerations because you're not only saving space on the road, you're doubling your energy efficiency because you're now carrying two people in a vehicle that previously carried one. Implementing change on this scale needs to be led by government but involve everybody. And so what you have is governments that can influence decisions in terms of land use, in terms of investment, in terms of getting a message out to people on what the issues are and what some of their options are. But ultimately, it's going to be the behavior of individual people in terms of how they travel and the things that they purchase. And it's those individual decisions that will actually change the amount of oil that we consume. I think, I think it is an enormous challenge. Uh, I think if we start talking about it, thinking about it, planning for it ahead of time and taking those actions, it increases our chances of success enormously. My, my worst fear is that we'll hit the peak and still be trying to figure out what our best course of action should be.